Man, happy Easter, everyone. Man, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Dan DeBell. I'm the lead pastor here at Abide Church. Uh, man, what a beautiful Easter morning. Come on, somebody. It's so nice to have some sunshine. Um, man, uh, I'm excited to, to share what God's put on my heart for today. And uh, specifically, a few weeks ago, as I was praying over Easter, I was praying specifically over, God, what do we need to speak on today? What do we need to talk on? And God gave me one, one word, and it was this, clean clean. We're going to dive into that here in just a little bit. We're going to talk about what exactly does that mean for us. But you know, this morning as I was reading, and I was just reading the, the story of the resurrection in Luke chapter 24, and the story of, uh, you know, three days after Jesus is crucified and he's buried, and there is some of his disciples, these women, they're coming to the tomb to, to see Jesus. They're coming to, to anoint his body. They're coming to mourn his death, truthfully. And as they show up, they walk up, and what do they see? The stone's been rolled away. And as the stone's been rolled away, they go in there, and you can imagine they walk in, and they look around, and there ain't nobody home. <laughs> there ain't nobody in the grave. And they look around, and finally they're wondering, what, what's going on here? And these two angels show up. And I love what the angel says to him. He says, look, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Amen, somebody? Come on. He is risen, and he's alive today. But the question remains, why are you, why are you looking here, in, among the dead, for someone who is alive, this doesn't make any sense. Many times we stop right there when we quote that verse, he is risen. But you know what the rest of the verse says is this, he has risen like he told you he would when he was with you, like he's already spoke to you, like he's already told you. I don't know about you, but it can be so easy in life Whenever life happens, though, yeah, I may be going to church, I may know all the Bible stories, I may know about Jesus, but when life happens, I forget what God has already spoken to me. And I go into panic mode. I fear, I worry, I try to gain control of the situation, I try to make it happen myself. When God many times is just saying, hey, would you just stop and would you just remember what I've already said to you? And that's my heart today as I read a passage from Ephesians and as we look at this together and as we talk about what does it mean to be clean because of Jesus, my heart is just this, that we would be reminded of what God has already done. I got my start in kids ministry, okay, and so I like to keep things very, very simple, and so you're welcome today, all right? It's going to be so simple. You can't help but walk out of here with something today, all right? So here's the thing. I'm going to, I'm going to start in Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read a passage here. And here's why I'm going to read this passage. As I was reading in Luke 24 this morning, the story of the resurrection in the empty tomb, if we're not careful, we can breeze past some of the most important parts of Scripture. I don't know about you, but I've been reading my quiet time before, and I'll come up to a passage that I know, right? I've been in church my whole life. I know this passage. I know this story. And my flesh says, I'll just skip to something that I haven't read in a while. But woe to us if we would breeze past what Jesus did for us. Hold on. If we don't understand the weight and the power behind what Jesus has done for us, we will miss out on the best things that God has for us. I will miss out on a whole side of God that he wants for me here on earth to experience. I will miss it completely if I don't understand and believe what Jesus did for me. In fact, many people believe, oh, yeah, Jesus went, he died on the cross, he was raised from the dead, so that I can go to heaven someday. That may be true, yes. But I would also say he, he did all of that, and God raised him from the dead so that God could get heaven into you today here on earth. It's not just a someday gospel. Someday I'm going to make it to heaven. Someday I'm going to be in heaven, I'm going to be whole, and I'm going to be happy, and everything's going to be great. Someday. God has things for you today to experience, and it's his will. Jesus said, pray, pray for God's will to come on earth and happen on earth as it is in heaven. He said, pray today to experience heaven on earth. Does it mean things are going to be perfect and it's all going to work out for you? No, it doesn't. But here's what it means. God has good things for you here to experience. But I have to take a step back every now and then, and I have to say, do I believe what God's word says about me? If I believe it, I can walk in the fullness of what God has for me. Let's read some scripture together. Ephesians 2, I'm going to read 10 verses today. 
We're going to look at these 10 verses, and then, then it's that simple. Okay, let's look at these 10 verses together. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 1, it says this. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and the inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ, and he seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all he has done for those who are united with Christ Jesus. A few verses left. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. I know there's a lot in these 10 verses, but we're going to break it down really, really simple. And it's simply this. Number one, if you're taking notes, if you got a note-taking card when you came in, you can write this down. We were sinners. We were sinners. This is the first thing the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 2 here. And this is an important fact. This is a very important fact. Let's look at Ephesians 2, verse 1. Let's go back to it. He says this, Once you were dead, once you used to live in sin, past tense, you used to be that way. Go to verse 3. All of us used to live that way. If we're not careful, here's what happens. Two things happen. Either one, I will be someone who never thinks that I'm a sinner. I never think that I actually have done. I'm like, I'm a pretty good person. And this is where kind of the rub happens in today's society, right? I don't know about you, but in 2021, if you just look around, it's pretty easy to offend people. You know what I'm talking about? It's pretty easy to rub people the wrong way in what you say and what you do. And many times what happens is when we look at God's Word, that's what happens. Number one, people get rubbed the wrong way because it's like, well, who are you to say that I'm a sinner? You don't know me. You don't know my story. Who are you to say that I'm not good enough to make it to heaven someday? Who are you? You know, whenever I was in college, I went to college at Roger State University in Claremore, and I got a degree in criminal justice. And as I was going through college, I actually worked at a little cafe there on campus, and it was called the Hillcat Hut. Come on, somebody. Hillcats. Um, the Hillcat Hut, uh, I'm not sure what a Hillcat is, but we, hey, we were awesome. Uh, Hillcat Hut. Anyway, when I worked there, uh, there was this older guy that I worked with, and he was, man, he was a lot older than me. And we were, one day we were talking, and he knew that I was a Christian. He knew that I went to church. We were talking about Jesus. And he looked at me, and, and he was just like, yeah, you know, you know I, don't really, I don't really go to church. I don't really, you know, pray or anything like that. But then he said this. He said, because me and God we kind of got it worked out. You know, we kind of have an agreement. Like he knows and I know and we're good. We got it worked out. The problem is, <laughs> if you looked at his life, you would have zero idea that he would call himself a Christian. The way he talked, the way he, uh, the way he conducted himself, the way he treated other people. Uh, this guy, he, he did not shine like a bright light in a dark world like we're commanded to as believers. He blended right in. You would have no idea. But here's why that's dangerous. I mean, God got an agreement. If I never realized that at one point in my life, I am a sinner, if I don't realize that I'm a sinner, then I will never have any need for a Savior. And if I have no need for a Savior, then what good is Jesus to me? But here's the issue. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. No one gets to the kingdom and experiences the kingdom of God to the fullest except through me. 
And so whenever I step back and I say, well, I'm pretty good. Me and God got it worked out. But I never actually step back and just say, no, I'm a sinner who needs help. If I never get to that point in my life, then I never give Jesus an opportunity to step into lordship of my life. I never give him a chance to actually become my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But it takes me stepping back and saying, you know what? I don't have all the answers. You know what? I need some help. You know what? I've messed up. I admit, Jesus, come help me. And at that moment, Jesus come in, can come in and he can work. But until that time, I have no need of a Savior. What good is Jesus to me? Dangerous place to live. But here's the other side of it. The other side of it is we were sinners. Jesus does not want you to stay as a sinner. He does not want you to continue to identify as a sinner once you become a part of his family. He says, I want to make you the righteousness of Christ. I want to bring you into right standing with God. I don't want you to continue to say, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, I was a sinner, but now I am a saint who can walk in the fullness of what God has for me. He says, I need you to graduate from sinner to saint, not just stay here and continue to get your butt kicked by the devil for the rest of your life. He says, I need you to graduate. I'm going to pull you out of your sin, and I'm going to put you in a place with me. What? He says, seated in the heavenly places with Christ. That's a place of authority. But I have to identify at some point, I need some help. But then when I move on, what? I was. That's why Paul said, you were. We all used to be. Paul says, I'm the worst of them all. I used to be that way, but not anymore after I met Jesus. Not anymore. The second thing is this. We were sinners. Number two, he shows us is this. But God loved us. So simple. But God loved us. This moment in time, all of these moments where it's things are going this way, but God showed up. And when he shows up, everything changes. One breath from him, one action from him, everything changes when God shows up. Let's look at it. Ephesians 2, let's go back to verse 4. It says this, I love this, but God is so rich in mercy, and he loves us so much. A little? No. So much. Hey, have you ever had a friend who you were best friends with, and you're best friends with this person, and then maybe you had a life change. Maybe you quit a job or you moved somewhere, and there was some distance between you and that person. And then all of a sudden, you stopped talking for a while. And then maybe life happened, and in life happens, there was a crisis that happened. And you, this person that you used, to, used to think was your best friend, or maybe they would still say, yeah, we're best friends. But they know nothing about the details of the crisis that's going on in your life. You ever been in that situation? I have. Somebody I was so close with, but we drifted with time and position, and I was going through hell, if I'm being honest. And that person said, he eventually had to come around and say, hey, I'm sorry, I have not been a good friend to you. I have not been a best friend to you. People will let you down every time. People will say, hey, I love you. Hey, I'm there for you. Hey, I'm praying for you. Hey, if you need anything, let me know. They will say it and speak it all day. God is not just a God who speaks good things. He is a God who speaks the truth, but then backs it with action every single time. Every time. But God loved us. He's not just, oh, yeah, I love you guys. Hey, love you. No, I love you so much, I'm going to send my own son, my only son, to die for you, to pay the price for you. I love you this much. I love you that much. I'm not just in words, but it's in deed as well. We were dead, but God gave us life when he raised Christ from the, the grave. God intervened. He sent his son to do what only he could do. In Isaiah 53, 5, it says this, but he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Our rebellion our sins. If we don't, if we're not careful, when we look at Scripture, we don't make it personal. 
We miss it. And Jesus just becomes an, a, a distant thought or figure or a good story. But what took him to the cross? Our rebellion. Pastor Dan's. Pastor Dan's sins. I put him there. But God, I was a sinner. But God loved me enough to say, give me your sin, son. Give me your sin, daughter. Let me pay the price for all of it. And Jesus says in return in John 10, he says, I have come that you may have life and have life more abundantly. Say that after me. Say abundantly. Say it like you mean it. Abundantly. I don't know about you, but that sounds good. Abundant life is not just, oh, I'm going to be rich and famous. I'm going to be up here and everyone else is down here. No, abundant living starts with spiritual abundance. Spiritual abundance bleeds into everything else, but if he can get my heart, it will change everything. That's abundant life. That's having life and life abundantly. God loves us so much that he proved it by doing something about our sin. There's a lot of religions out there, and many of them say, you know what? You need to die to show how much you love our God. Our God says, hey, I've already died to prove how much I love you. You don't have to do, <laughs> all you have to do is say, Jesus, I received the gift of salvation. What an incredible God we serve. He doesn't ask for more of you. Try harder, be better, try to make yourself clean enough so that you can come into my presence. He says, no, will you just receive what I've already done? We were sinners, but God loved us. And number three is this. By grace, we are made clean. By grace. I love this in Ephesians 2, 7. It says this. It says, so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and his kindness. God can point to us. What's he saying? God can say, look at, look at these people. Look at you. Look at me. Look at them. Not at, look at how good they are. Man, they're the best of the best. No, he says, look at how bad, sinful, far from me that they were. But my grace is so much bigger and better than anything they've done. To what? Show you my kindness. To bring them into right standing, to make them clean. But so many times we think, well, I'm just going to strive. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to be better. Man, I've been living kind of away from Jesus, so I'm going to try to fix my life up this week so I can go to church on Sunday, and then maybe I'll fit in. Can I tell you? Stop. That burden is heavy. I'll try, and I'll try, and I'll try, and it'll never be good enough. But Jesus says, look, I can point to you, and I can say, yeah, you've messed up, and it was bad, and you've done some really terrible things. Yeah, my grace is bigger than all of the terrible things you've ever done. It's bigger, and it's more powerful to work on your behalf if you will accept it. God's grace is enough to meet you where you're at, and it's enough to clean you. Let me show you an example of this. In John chapter 8, and I'll, I'll wrap up with this. I told you I'll keep it simple today. John 8. Here we see the story of Jesus, and he's with his disciples. And as he's with his disciples there, there's a crowd gathering with him. And he's talking with his disciples, and there's this crowd, and all of a sudden from the back there's this commotion that's taking place. There's something going on back there, and wouldn't you know, it's a bunch of religious leaders, a bunch of teachers of the law. And here they show up, and as they're walking in, they, they have this woman by the arm, and they're dragging her through the crowd, pushing people out of the way, pushing the disciples out of the way. And here they have this woman. She was caught in the act of adultery. So they grab her, and they get, finally get to Jesus, and they throw her at the feet of Jesus in the dirt. And there they are, this angry crowd of religious people. And there's this woman who is crying because she knows what's coming. 
She's crying, and there they are. They have rocks and stones in their hands. And they throw her at the feet of Jesus, and they say, Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law says that she should be put to death. The law says that she should die for the sin that she's committed. And rightfully so. That's what we've been doing for for years. We should kill her. We have the stones. We're ready. Jesus, we have extra rocks for you to take. Jesus, she's supposed to be put to death. What do you say? And here we see the grace of Jesus in that he doesn't say a word to them, but he kneels down and he begins to write in the dirt. And what exactly he's writing, we don't know. But he's writing and as he's writing, the crowd is getting more and more angry. Jesus, are are you deaf? Did you not hear us? Did we tell you she's caught? Like we know it's her, okay? Jesus, she's supposed to die. But what do you say? Jesus gets up and he looks at the angry mob of people and he says, let the one that has has never sinned throw the first stone. And he leans back down and he continues riding in the dirt. And one by one, this angry mob of religious people who know the law. From the oldest to the youngest, it says, they drop the rocks, they turn, and they go home. And in this moment, you, can, you see this woman who's been crying because she knows she deserves death. She knows what the law was before she committed the act. She deserves to die according to the law. Jesus looks at her and I believe he gets on her level and he looks her in the eye and he says, daughter, where are your accusers? She looks back and she says, Lord, there are none. There are none. And here's the grace of Jesus. If you hear anything today, just hear this. Jesus looks at her and he says, neither do I condemn you. But he doesn't stop there. And this is the part that we miss so many times in our lives. Neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. You were a sinner, but I've pulled you out of your mess. I've embraced you and I said, I love you. I don't condemn you. I am for you. I have a plan for you. But go and live free from your sin. It's not you anymore. But so many times we twist the grace of Jesus and we say, Well, I'm saved. I can do whatever I want. I can do whatever I want and God's going to forgive me. I can live this way do this, treat people that way. I can do whatever, and I can always go to Jesus, and he's going to forgive me, and he's going to wash me, and I'll be great. Let us never get comfortable with the grace of Jesus that we would, so comfortable with it that we would abuse it. Because the grace of Jesus is not a pass to continue sinning, as the world would tell you, as many churches would tell you. It's not a pass to continue sinning. The grace of Jesus is an invitation to live clean. Go and sin no more. Go. I'm with you. Are you going to mess up again? Probably. But get back up. Remember I'm with you. This is not your identity anymore. You're not a sinner. You were a sinner. Now you're a saint. Now go live and do what I have for you. Go. Sin no more. I've got good things for you. At the end of this this story, Jesus in John 8, 12, he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but he will have the light of life. What's he saying? Look, you no longer have to walk in your sin, in your shame, in your guilt, or in your addiction. He says, you know where the light is. You found the light. 
His name is Jesus. Now walk with him. Walk in him. Free from sin. Free from addiction. Free from what the world would pin on you and say, that was me, but I am made new in Christ. All things have become new. Old things have passed away. I am new. Walk in him. Walk with him. It's what Paul wraps up in Ephesians 2. In Ephesians 2.10, he says this. After that whole passage, you were dead, but God loved you. By his grace, you've been saved. He says, look, for we are God's masterpiece. Man, this is so good. What is a masterpiece? It's an artist's best piece of work. I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life where I didn't feel like God's masterpiece because of what I said, what I did, how I treated someone, the, the stuff that I was living with, the sin that I had in my life. I didn't feel like a masterpiece. But God says, I will pull you from where you were. And I see the potential. As an artist sees the potential in a lump of clay, he says, I see something in there. And if you will let me mold you, shape you, and pull out all the extra crap, if we're being real, if you let me pull it out, you can live as my masterpiece. I don't know how you walked in here today. Whether you were sick, whether you're battling an addiction, whether you got issues with with relationships in your life, but can I remind you of your identity in Christ? If you would trust Jesus, you don't have to live in sin. If you will trust Jesus, you don't have to live in sickness. We read the verse earlier. By his stripes we're made whole. We are healed. You may feel sick, but God says, I see you healed. You may feel addicted, but God says, I can set you free. You may feel alone, and you may be surrounded by friends and family, but you still feel alone, and there's this spirit of depression on your life, and you don't know what to do and you're just faking it every day. You're going through the motions, but you feel depressed and it's isolating you on the inside. You feel alone. And God says, but you're, he says, receive my spirit. You're never alone. I live in you. You're in my family. You're my son and you're my daughter. Come to me. You may be full of fear. God says you can be full of faith. You may feel dirty and unclean on the inside. But Jesus says, I've made you clean through my blood and my sacrifice. You may feel like you're a sinner. And to be honest, maybe today you walked in a sinner. Can I tell you? That's okay. Can I tell you? You're welcome here. Because Jesus, our Heavenly Father, and his Holy Spirit are constantly calling for those that are sinners. He's constantly tugging on their heart. And I will tell you, you're not here by accident. He didn't bring you here by accident. He's not nudging you in your spirit by accident. You may feel like a sinner, but God says you can be my masterpiece. You can be a righteous masterpiece. This is the gospel, church. Isn't it simple? It's not hard, and it's not difficult. We don't need to add a bunch of other books to make this book make sense. We don't need to add a lot of other stuff. I don't have to quote a bunch of people. I can say, here's what Jesus said. Here's what his word says, and it's this simple. We were sinners. Were, not meant to stay there. He always wants to graduate us to the next thing. We were sinners. But God loved us so much that he meets you and he meets me where I'm at, no matter how bad, no matter how ugly, no matter how messed up. He meets me and he says, will you come with me? And by his grace, he gives you a path to abundant life, eternal life, and clean, living, righteous life through him but only through him. The grace of Jesus is never to be abused. What does it sound like? I don't condemn you of your sin because I've already taken it. I paid the price so that you can go free and you can live clean. Now go and sin no more. Will you mess up from time to time? Yeah. But you don't have to be that old sinner that you were. 
There's life in Christ today. And you can live free from that addiction and that sin that's been holding you back today. But it's only through Jesus. Stop striving. Stop trying to clean up your own life. When Jesus said, I've already made it clean if you'd put your trust in me. Can I pray for you? Heavenly Father, I love you. Heavenly Father, you're good. You are good and you do good. You're the perfect father. You're the perfect dad. You love us deeply. Father, I just pray today that if there's any of your sons or your daughters that are far from you, that you'd help me find them. Help me reintroduce them to you today. In Jesus' name.